Hi, and welcome to this episode of John's Model Kit Review. Today, I will be reviewing AMT's 148 scale P40N Warhawk. This is AMT kit number 8798. On this build, I used True Details wheels and Edward pre-painted seat belts. In this review, I'm going to be giving a little bit of the P40N history. I'm also going to give an overview of what comes with the kit in the box, my construction notes on the kit, my painting and weathering process, and then I'll give my conclusions at the end. P40 history. The Curtis Wright P40 began life as a re-engined P36, itself a mid-30s design that was a delight to fly, but too slow for a modern fighter. The XP40 was first flown in 1938, and delivery of production aircraft to the Army Air Corps began in June of 1940. In air-to-air -air combat, the P40 proved itself highly effective when flown by the skilled pilots of the American Volunteer Group known as the Flying Tigers. General Claire Chenault demanded that pilots exploit the P-40's strengths of rugged construction, heavy firepower, and fast dive speed, and avoid trying to outclimb or outturn their opponents. In the ETO, the P-40 was found to be wanting due to its rather lackluster high-altitude performance, a common problem with all Allison V-1710 engined aircraft. As the war progressed, the airframe was constantly modified to keep it competitive, but the P-40 was never a leading-edge fighter. Although the P-40 was America's primary fighter at the beginning of the war, it was gradually replaced by the newer types in frontline service. Because of its second-line status, the P-40 was sent to less critical fronts where it was increasingly used as a fighter-bomber. In an effort to increase the performance, the P-40 was put on a diet. Lighter wheels, reduced fuel and equipment loads, and a reduction in armament from 650s to 450s made the early P-40N the fastest of the P-40s. The early P-40N was able to see 378 miles an hour with its 1200 horsepower Allison V1710-81 and reduced weight. Only a few of the truly lightweight P-40Ns were produced. The P-40N5 saw the return of 650s and the addition of the improved vision canopy that usually sets the N apart from the rest of the Warhawk line. The P-40N was the most produced P-40 with 5,215 being built. Universally loved by the pilots who flew it, the P-40 gave sterling service when it was needed most and held the fort until newer types were available. The Kit Released in 1995, the AMT-Ertl P-40N comes in a large box with nice box art of Geronimo downing a Betty Bomber. Upon opening, one finds four sprues of soft, light gray plastic, a sprue of clear parts, and a decal sheet with markings for two aircraft. The first of which is Geronimo of the 15th Fighter Group, 45th Fighter Squadron, and Rosie the Riveter of the 49th Fighter Group, 7th Fighter Squadron. This particular kit was made in the USA before AMT sent production to Mexico and the production quality plummeted. There is a little flash, but nothing that won't clean up easily. This kit has finely engraved panel lines and rivet detail. In comparison with the newer Airfix P40B kit, this kit is so much more refined and so much more petite in the surface detailing, and it just looks really nice. It looks much more scale appropriate than the far newer Airfix kit. A basic interior, clear but thick transparent parts, and only a few decals. The fairly low number of parts makes this kit look like a relaxing weekend build. I should know better having built AMT's P40F. Construction. I started this one by removing the fuselage halves and engine covers from the sprue and cleaning them up. As with all AMT P40 kits, once the engine covers are glued in place, there are two major depressions on the nose that must be shimmed to provide a flat area for the spinner. I cut out two pieces of plastic sheet stock and glued them in place. I also scribed and cut out the rear fuselage section specific to the end model. Fitting the fuselage halves together, it became apparent that this wouldn't be a weekend build. The nose intake needed to be blocked off, the exhaust fit at a weird upward angle, and the locating pins didn't line things up nicely. I cut off all the locating pins and then glued a series of plastic tabs on the inside surface of one half such that they would give support to the other side when the halves were glued together. 
I then shimmed the lower side of the exhaust mounting plates so the exhaust would be level once glued in place. Finally, I cut and glued plastic sheet to block off the nose intake. I painted the inside of the fuselage halves interior green and once the radiator was painted and glued in place, I glued the fuselage halves together. At this point, I printed out a picture of the instrument panel for a P40N and proceeded to paint the kit part accordingly. I cut the solid plastic reflector from the kit gun sight and replaced it with a piece of thin, clear plastic. The interior pieces were painted interior green, detailed, washed with a thin black oil-based wash, and dry brushed to bring out the detail. The rear fuel tank was painted olive drab and weathered prior to installation. I had to fill a sink mark right in the middle of the pilot's back plate armor, since it is clearly visible through the canopy. Do yourself a favor at this point and reshape the backplate armor behind the pilot's head. As it comes in the kit, the pilot could not see anything behind him. I did not notice this until after I had glued on the canopy and I had to rip it back off again. I then had to dremel away the sides of the backplate on either side of the headrest pad. I assembled the interior and added Edward's pre-painted U.S. Army Air Force seatbelts at this time. They're simply beautiful. I installed the interior in the fuselage, glued in the shimmed exhaust, and set the fuselage aside to dry. Once dry, I filed the nose flat for the spinner and sanded the seams. Next, as a departure from the instructions, I decided to glue the upper wings to the fuselage prior to attaching them to the lower wing. I did this to avoid the dreaded wing root seam so common on aircraft models. I was able to get a very good alignment of the wing roots using this method. Once dry, I glued the lower wing and tailplanes to the model. Fit here was good, requiring minimal filler. The bulges on the leading edges of the wing and the radiator outlet flaps were glued on, as was the belly fuel tank. I also attached the canopy with white glue at this time. The middle sliding section of the canopy was too wide, so I had to hold it in place with toothpicks and tape until it was dry. While masking, my number 11 X-Acto blade slipped and I made a nice gouge right across the front windscreen. No alternative but to rip it off and sand out the scratch with 1500 grit wet or dry sandpaper. I then polished the windscreen with auto polishing compound and a cotton cloth. I reattached the front canopy section using white glue and finished masking the canopy. While reading another review of the P40N, I noticed a dorsal frame member that runs down the spine of the canopy. There's no mention of this in the kit instructions, so I had to track down a wartime picture of a P40N for reference. Once confirmed, I removed the tape where the spine would run and she was ready for paint. Colors and markings. I chose to use the kit markings for Rosie the Riveter of the 49th Fighter Group, 7th Fighter Squadron. This plane was in the Pacific Theater of Operations and wore olive drab over neutral gray. A nice shark mouth and a white vertical tail added some spice to the rather boring paint scheme. The directions called for medium green disruptive camouflage to be applied to the leading and trailing edges of the wings and elevators. Since I could find no pictures of 49th Fighter Group P40Ns with this, I left it off. I can add the medium green later if I find a picture of this plane confirming that it's there. I airbrushed polyscale acrylics, first spraying interior color on the window framing, then spraying the white base for the red nose and white tail. I masked the spinner with automotive pinstriping. I then masked off the white tail with Tamiya tape and used a piece of kneadable eraser that was rolled into a snake and wrapped around the fuselage for a softer edge between the white and olive drab. I then sprayed polyscale's neutral gray for the underside color. Once the underside was masked off, I sprayed polyscale olive drab on the upper surfaces. Once dry, I sprayed olive drab lightened with RLM 02 gray green on areas more likely to be faded by the sun. I let the plane dry overnight and then applied various powdered artist pastels to bring out panel lines, exhaust stains, etc. I applied the pastels with a soft, closely cropped paintbrush, removing the excess with kneadable eraser. I then sealed the pastels with an airbrushed coat of future floor polish. The kit decals were used and went down fine. It took a lot of champ setting solution to get them settled into the panel lines. To help, I cut them along panel lines with a sharp number 11 X-Acto blade when they were almost dry. The shark mouth decals were the most difficult, needing many stress relief cuts to conform to the curved radiator shroud. I had to touch up these decals with paint where they wrapped around the cowling. 
At this point, I decided to give the airframe a wash before a final flat clear coat was applied. I used a very fine paintbrush and an oil-based dark brown wash. The gloss coat allowed the wash to flow freely in the panel lines, and it was easy to clean up any excess with a Q-tip dampened with mineral spirits. Finally, I airbrushed polyscale clear flat acrylic over the entire airframe. I did a final application of pastels and brush painted the guns, landing lights, etc. Then I glued on the landing gear and other final bits. I had decided to use True Detail's resin P40N wheels, and I'm glad I did. They really set the model off. I used Tester's Silver oil-based paint to simulate chipping around maintenance panels and scuffing on areas walked on by pilots and ground crew. I had some great photos of actual planes that I use as a reference for this step. Conclusions. This kit was way more work than I expected. I came close a couple of times to pitching it, but I'm glad I didn't. I love the way this bird turned out. I would like to thank Tom Cleaver for the great P40N reviews he has done for Modeling Madness. They were a tremendous reference. As far as the kit is concerned, I have mixed emotions. While I can't recommend this kit over the Hasegawa P40N on any criteria except price, it can be turned out well, and it's simple enough for modelers of any skill level. I'd love to know what you guys think. If any of you have built this kit before and want to share your experiences, please feel free to post in the comment section below. As always, I hope you found this video entertaining and informative, and until next time, model on.